The definition of sufficient statistic. T is sufficient for theta if the probability that x equals x given t equals t is independent of theta. Not very clear. And what they are trying to say is that the probability of getting some value of theta given your data and the sufficient statistic is the same thing as the probability that theta equals that value just given the sufficient statistic. In other words, if you know the sufficient statistic, you don't need to go back to the data for more info. There's no more info to be had. You know everything you know about theta if you know the sufficient statistic. That's the idea. How do we get that into that? First of all, I'm just going to write given t equals t here. It'll shorten things. They're saying the probability that theta is theta given x is x, big X, little x, you know what I mean, variable and value, equals the probability that theta equals theta. But that's the definition of independence. That means that the probability of theta equals theta and x equals x is the probability that theta equals theta times the probability that x equals x. And that's also the same thing as saying the probability of x equaling x given theta equaling theta is equal to the probability that x equals x. All three of those are the same thing. They are all expressing the independence of theta and data given this sufficient statistic. And this last statement is essentially the same thing as this. Because remember, if we put the given back in, we're saying the probability that x equals x given t equals t and theta equals theta is equal to the probability that x equals x just given t equals t. But that means it's independent of theta, and that's exactly what they said there. So their definition actually means if you have the sufficient statistic, you don't have to go back to the data. If we've clarified that, we can move on to the next step. Now, the factorization theorem says that an estimator t is sufficient for theta if and only if there exist functions g of t and theta and h of x such that f of x given theta equals g of t given theta times h of x. That's certainly hard to understand. When I was first looking at it, like, wait, doesn't everything factor that way? You could just make h of x a 1. But that's not quite what they're saying. First of all, this here, f of x given theta, this might represent a probability in the discrete case or a PDF in the continuous case. And what it's representing is the probability of getting your data for a given value of parameter. They're saying you can write the expression for that, presumably. If you have a distribution, you can say, what's the probability I get these data for my distribution? And the calculation will probably involve theta. Now, once you do that, the idea is you take that probability density function and you factor out all the parts with theta, all the parts on, with the parameter. If you do that, it's now a question. When you did that, the piece that you got out, the part with all the thetas, does that have any x's besides t? If it doesn't have any x's but t, then t is sufficient. You can have whatever you want over here. You can have x's and t's, just no thetas. So not every function satisfies this. When you pull the thetas out, you can pull the sufficient statistic with it, but you can't pull any other x's. That's what it's claiming. Now for the proof. It's an if and only if, so we have to prove it both ways. First, let's assume that t is sufficient and show that the f of x given theta factors in the way they claim. This side is short. The probability that x equals x given theta is the probability that x equals x and t equals t given theta, because if you know x, then you know t. You can rewrite that as the probability that x equals x given t equals t and theta times the probability that t equals t given theta. Everything here is given theta. But now we're going to remove the theta from this piece because the definition of sufficient statistic applies. The probability of getting your data given the sufficient statistic and theta is equal to the probability of x equals x just given t equals t. You don't need the theta. 
So that's where the assumption of sufficiency comes in. Once you do that, this has no theta in it. This is our h of x. And this has no x's other than the ones built into t, the estimator. Therefore, we have the factorization, and one direction is proven. Now for the other direction. We're going to assume that this factorization holds, and we're going to show that t is sufficient. This is the direction we're generally using when we use the factorization theorem. We want to take some distribution, we want to factor it, and from that conclude that we have a sufficient statistic, because it's easier than going all the way back to the definition. In the discrete case, we're going to assume that this f is actually a probability, so I'll write it that way. We're going to start with this expression, the probability of getting your data given the statistic and the parameter. Since that's a conditional, we can use the definition of conditional. We're still leaving everything as conditional of theta. Now we have two different expressions, and we need to work out what each of them are. The numerator, probability that x is x and t equals t given theta, can just be condensed to probability that x equals x given theta, because if you know x, then you know t. It's redundant. This expression is actually this. This is what we were assuming was g of t given theta times h of x. So there is our assumption coming into play. Now for the denominator, the probability that t equals t given theta. We can expand that into the probability that x equals x and t equals t given theta, so long as we are summing over all the cases of x where t comes out correctly. Having done that, we already showed that this expression inside the summation, which is right here, is equal to that. So we replace it with g of t equals t given theta times h of x. That is still within the summation. Now, it turns out, given that we are only considering cases of x where t has the correct value, this g of t equals t given theta is not dependent on which of those x's we use which means that is a constant as far as the summation is concerned, and we can pull it out. Having done that, we have this expression times this expression, and that's the denominator. Putting the pieces of the fraction together, numerator over denominator, we get this. I took the g and pulled it in front. Now these g's say exactly the same thing. t is simply a shorthand for t equals little t. So these expressions cancel out, which leaves us with this situation we have this formula here that has no thetas in it. This is free of theta or independent of theta, and that's what we wanted. That condition is the definition of being a sufficient statistic, and we've proven the discrete case. The continuous case is much the same with a lot of integrals instead of summations, but that's all I have time for today. Thanks for watching.